Mother's Day, I'm going to talk about two moms today in Scripture. And the understanding is the multitude of uh, uh, changes that can go through a woman's mind on becoming a mother or experiencing new motherhood as far as that is concerned and also experiencing loss as a mother. I can relate on having witnessed both of these ends of the spectrum in the lives of people I've loved. I've watched my wife uh, give birth to our daughter. And I remember her concern upon being pregnant with Miranda because the Lord had told us it was uh, our daughter. But the ultrasound thing had said it was indeed a boy. You know that thing they put around you and. They, they all the way up until she went into labor they kept saying sir I'm, I'm sorry but it's a, it, it appears that this is going to be a boy and I said no I don't know what your machine is saying but I know what I heard and that's going to be that's a girl all and so my wife in the delivery room in the labor room labor room right that's what they call it and she says, she looks up at me and she's got tears in her eye. And it's not from the labor, but it was because she had a concern, because she's practical. And she says to me, I really wanted you to have a girl, but I, what if it's a boy? I don't even know if she remember that. But I looked at that little young, beautiful woman. And I said two things, Lord, I'm glad I'm not her. And two, I said, Marilyn, don't worry, it's a girl. I said, his name would be Miranda. If, it, if I'm, did you remember that? I said, his name would be Miranda. So we go into the delivery room where the baby's making the grand entrance and the crown, baby crowns, is that what they call it, the baby crowns? And I'm thinking, why everybody say this is gonna make you squeamish? It make me squeamish. I was cool with it, it wasn't me. And uh, the doctor said, here he comes, here he comes, here he comes. One good push for us, Miss, Miss White. One more good push, and here, here he comes. And she pushed, and the doctor said, here she is. That was amazing. And I've also, and I looked at my wife's face, the joy, the relief. The, 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 the relief, she went from being in mm, to just like that. I saw it on her face. Now, anything else I didn't see, I was too busy messing with the baby. That baby screamed until I held her. When they gave me the baby, she stopped screaming just like that. As soon as they, they said here, and she just stopped. But I've also seen the other spectrum. I watched my mother as she sat at the foot of the bed of my sister when my sister gave up the ghost. I looked at her face and I understand why parents say you shouldn't have to go before you. Your children shouldn't have to go before you. I saw that look on my mother-in-law's face when my brother-in-law passed. There's something about that kind of loss that I've not seen on anyone's face but a mother who has lost her child. I've seen agony on men that have lost children and the pain of that loss, but there's a different look a mother has. And that's, I think that's directly attached to the look she has when she brings that child into the world. Diametrically opposed to one another. It's a grief that only God can touch. And so I want to talk to you about two different women under two different circumstances, and I'll try not to keep you too long. So will you pray with me just a moment? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the mothers that have given birth to great men. And I thank you for the mercies you've shown to women that have given birth and have lost their child. I thank you, O oh God, because you had a plan and it started in a garden. And Father, I thank you because you laid it out 
perfectly for your glory. Help me now in this hour to show forth some of your power, Lord, in these words, in this hour, and, and to encourage and to show how mighty you are in life and in death. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Father. I want to go, want you to go with me to the book of Genesis, just briefly. Chapter 21. And it's a story that's familiar to most. Some of you have actually dared to listen to the preacher when he preached concerning this. And some of you might have even run across the scripture when you uh, opened your Bibles just for decoration's sake and happened to look upon it. You know how you just open it up in your house so when people come over they can thank you reading it? And then, and then there's some of you that have actually read the scripture. Uh, I'm trying to be nice today. It's Mother's Day. Amen. Chapter 21, please, verses 1 through 9. And the word of the Lord reads, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham, that Sarah should have given children suck. For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. You may be seated. Mother, one. This is a, a, an interesting tale, and this is an interesting declaration that is being made in light of what has just transpired. One of the things that I'm drawn to in this completeness of what we've read is when Sarah said, God had made me to laugh. Because if you'll recall, she overheard a conversation where the Lord had proclaimed that Sarah would indeed bear Abraham a child and she laughed about it. She, she thought, hey, there's no way. How in the world? I'm old. I am O-L-D. I'm tired. My womb is dead. There's no room in the womb. No vacancies. But God had a plan. But God's plans tend to come with a promise. When God promises that he will do something, all you have to do is wait for God to do it. Now that don't mean sit back and do nothing. That means continue to live according to the precepts of God and simply wait upon the Lord to complete the promise he made. Now, what gets me about this is Sarah actually has something to say. And she says, that, I loved what she said. She said, the people will laugh with me. Because now she's not even laughing at the idea because the idea is no longer an idea. The I it is now a living kid named Isaac. Uh, and, and it goes to a lot of issues. It goes to every kind of issue you could come up with. God may make a promise to you in 19. He may have made a promise to you in 2005. And you may not see that promise come to fruition until 2035. But look at how God did this thing with Sarah. He waited until she got real old. Because he made a pact with Abraham before he left her. Uh, he, 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 they, a long time has been since Abraham has left her. And now, here he is a hundred years old. God bless you, Abraham. Now, what we don't find is this prescription for Viagra. Uh, don't you know when God said a man going to make a woman pregnant and he don't care how old he is or how old she is, you don't need nothing but oxygen. God will do the rest. 
But Sarah's joy is now apparent in the promise of God being fulfilled in her. Uh, God did a little surgery. God did, did some, some work on Abraham's back and in his muscles and, and in his mind. You know, because men, we got minds that could go crazy when, when God sent us in the right spot. Hello? Uh, yeah, you know how it is. Let your woman walk in at, uh, at the right time wearing the right thing. Your mind go crazy. You get to fidgeting. Hey, girl. How you doing? Hmm? Like you just seen her for the first time. You ain't, you've been married 30 years. I know. I look at my wife, man. Woo. I'm going to leave that alone. But the look on her face, can you imagine the joy of seeing how wrong she was when she thought that there was no room in the womb? When she thought that there was, there was no vacancies here. I mean, there's, there's no, we're not going to have any occupants in here. Huh? But she had seen God move in her life. She had witnessed God's miraculous power in bringing up Abraham. She had witnessed how God had saved her out of Egypt. She had witnessed many things. And now God is laughing at it. He's not laughing at her. He's laughing at her. Look, look. He, can you see him? Look at her. She, she just tickled to death. But before she had the joy, she had to have some pain. There's something about a mother that well, all bets off. I, I looked at a show the other day, and it was a woman that was having a baby. She was in the emergency room because there was a problem with her ability to breathe, right? Her heart was messing up. And they found out that this young mother had a problem that if they didn't do surgery, this baby, she would die. And they said, now the only problem we seem to have is you're pregnant. She was only a couple of months pregnant. And they said, look, the only way we can ensure that you will not die is if we terminate your pregnancy. And she said, you can't take my baby. He said, ma'am, well, well, if we don't do this surgery, it is of a certainty that you both will die. And she said, no, this can't be so. You have to figure something out because my husband died a few months ago in war. And this is all I have left of my husband. This is the legacy that I can keep and remind me of what I already lost. And so they did some figuring and calculating and all of this other thing and they found a way that they thought would be successful in doing the surgery and saving both the mom and the child. Now, when they did it, it all seemed well. All seemed well. And the baby was fine, the mother was fine, but the, 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 she wasn't quite out of the woods. But the doctor started boasting about how good of a job he did. And a few minutes later, he was back in there trying to save her life because she bled out. But here's my point in bringing that up. Isn't it a beautiful thing that a mother will rather die than to risk losing her child? Even one whose eyes she has not peered into. Even one whose voice a cry in the middle of the night she's yet to hear. But this young mother said, I would, I'm not going to live without my baby. What a thing to hear. Sarah was willing to live without a child that came from her. Even so much so that she was willing to have an Egyptian slave named Tamar. Was that her name? Hey God. What did I say? Tamar? Hey God, thank you. She, had, she wanted the Egyptian slave Hagar to carry a baby for her husband. Now that wasn't part of the promise. But even in the, 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 the delicacies of the moment where she's making a decision that God didn't give consent to, God is still going to do what he said he was going to do. I, I saw this played out on another show. The woman adopted a child and found out after she got the baby, she adopted that she was pregnant by her husband. 
Uh, there are people that, that struggle to figure out ways to, to do things in terms of having babies. And all Sarah had to do was wait on the Lord and get busy with Abe. Uh-huh. So here's this mother whose joy now is the leader of many peoples. Her joy is Isaac. This Isaac grows up and now he's the father of many peoples all around the world today. Because God heard a woman laugh at his plan. You know, God has a way of doing things to, to bring us so much joy. I remember when I looked in Miranda's eyes as a little girl, a baby, and I looked at my wife, for some reason that little girl made me love her mother so much more. When I looked in the eyes of that little precious child, she was a beautiful baby. When I looked at her, I just, man, it was, Marilyn could have said, okay, now I want you to run across the Atlantic with a gasoline suit on, and we're gonna light the ocean afire but you run across there for me and bring me a can of sardines. I would have been hotter than Richard Pryor, but I'd have tried to run across that ocean. That's how, uh, that's how my heart felt towards this woman because of the birth of our child. I watched my wife eat lemon after lemon after lemon while she carried that child. It is something magnificent about a woman's physiology when she's with child. This woman that is soon to be called mother. And Sarah, can you get in her mind for a moment as she's going through the process of giving birth to her first child? She had never brought a life through the matrix. And now she's at 90 years old. And now she's looking and rubbing this, this baby bump, as they call it, together and today. And, and they, she's seeing it grow and grow. Her appetite, she won't mutton. She probably was craving pig feet, too. Huh? She's no telling what she was eating. She's probably eating dates and, and all kinds of foods and trying to satisfy the hunger of this child and the hunger for because her body was going through some things. Nowadays, doctors look at you crazy if you eat like that. But she had to nourish, nourish this baby. Can you imagine what was going through her mind? That was probably nice when she said, Lord, am I going to be able to do this? Lord, will I live through this to see my child? Will I see this? Can you imagine what she was dealing with and carrying this baby? Going through throwing up, cramps, fake labor, and real labor. Going through all of this thing, trying to take care of her daily business, but she had people taking care of her as well. Will, you, will she live to see the eyes of this baby? Because there was no promise that she would see the baby. There was no promise that she would see this baby. But there was a promise that she would give birth to this child. God is able to do mighty things in his creation. So here we have one woman. She's sitting back. Can you imagine when that pain hit and the travail started? And she went on day two and the travail is still there. Day four, the travail is still occurring. Then day five and then when the, when, when the cervix begins to open up and the, 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 the nursemaids are there, the handmaidens are there. And, and they're, the midwives are there and they're ready and they're preparing her. And can you imagine her heart? Is focused on giving birth. Her mind is focused on getting this life out of me. She needs to be delivered. Sarah needs to be delivered. The baby's not delivered. The woman is delivered of the burden of carrying the child. That's what it's about. Uh, she is delivered of the child. And when she's pressing and pushing and hoping and and her heart is pounding in her and the veins pop up in her. I saw veins on the side of my wife's head. I'm serious, man. I saw veins protrude. And I looked at her and the determination I've got. Her body went into overdrive. The woman's body begins to do what nature tells it to do. You can't stop what's getting ready to happen. Because guess what? Somebody's coming out. And Sarah's pushing. And she's wondering, if when this baby leaves my body, will I see his eyes? Will I see his face? One can only imagine that had to go through her mind. 
that had to have gone through her mind because I'm told that there's no pain greater than that. The only pain greater can be possibly greater than giving birth is when your shoulder dislocates completely out of socket. You know how I know? It happened to me. Woo, that's pain. And and if that if a woman giving birth is great pain, that's got to be the next worst. That's got to be that that make you cry like woo, jeez. I'm I'm not gonna keep it much longer, but I want to share these stories with you because it's important for you to understand, children, what your mother goes through, what your mother went through, and how precious you are to your mother. Can you imagine having that child inside of you for nine months, eight months? And that child comes out and defies you when they learn how to walk and talk because you nurtured it and you fed it. And when they were sick, you took care. Your daddy wasn't around because daddy was at work or daddy was just gone and he was a sorry, no good or whatever the case may have been. But mama was there feeding you, clothing you, bathing you, trying to get your temperature to come down, worried about how they're going to get you to the doctor because they have no insurance, they have no car, they have no money. And then you grow up and you want to get full of yourself and challenge your parents. You want to tell her she don't know. You, you 16, 17, 18 years old. Now, all of a sudden, you have all the knowledge of our, every world book encyclopedia ever printed. When did you press out a child? How, how many times did you throw up while she was pregnant with you? Uh, how many nights did she walk to, to go to work when you were laying up looking at cartoons? But when she was pressing you out of her, she yearned to see your eyes. That same woman you want to turn your nose up at and, and give her the shoulder and, and then expect her to still feed you, house you, and close you. That's called ingratitude. It's called, I don't care how bad your mama is. My mother was a drunk. When I went in the military, she was a drunk. But my mother received a check from me every month in spite of all the things she did to hurt me, in spite of all the negativism.